And it's important to not get upset when things don't go exactly how you may have thought that they were going to go. Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening to another episode of The Creative Truth. Today, I'm joined by Skylar Lanier. Uh, she's a PR professional here in Savannah, Georgia, but pretty soon she's leaving us. She's moving away. So before she leaves, uh, I wanted to have her on the show. So to open up the show, will you just tell us a little bit about who you are, where you're from, and the big move coming up? All right. Well, thank you so much for having me, Tyler. I um, So as you mentioned, I've worked in Savannah for the last couple of years as a public relations specialist um, with Cecilia Russo Marketing. Um, and that, so I've done agency PR and had lots of different clients across all kinds of industries, which has afforded a lot of interesting experiences for sure. Um, but I am born and raised in Savannah, um, went to school at UGA, and then I did my master's in Scotland in Edinburgh at the University of Edinburgh. and. Um, and that was in literature. So I studied public relations in English in undergrad. And then I went on to do um, a course in literature for my master's um, because I love to write. I really love to write. I love to read. Um, and then the last couple of years, I worked, as I mentioned, with Cecilia Russo Marketing, which is funny because I started as an intern years ago with them. Um, so it's been fun to watch the company grow. And then I am moving to Norfolk um, in July. I'm starting a new position remotely here shortly, um, but it's because I'm getting married and yeah, my fiance congrats. lives. Thank you. <laughs> my fiance lives there um, in Virginia, so we found a place in Norfolk and awesome. going to make my way up there soon. Cool. Um, so, part of what I love about video is that every day I'm doing something different. You mentioned like having all these different clients with CRM. Um, what are some, you said, interesting experiences? Like, what are some weird things you're like, why, I can't believe this is part of my job. Yeah, oh, there, I mean, there are loads of things like that. Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. It can be, it's like you end up doing everything from creating a post about you know plumbing for social media and like learning weird plumbing facts and learning weird dentistry facts and just things that you never expected you know but they're really great for fun facts and conversation um to then planning you know 200 plus person events and sometimes you're making a video and sometimes you're planning an entire virtual event because COVID and sometimes um, without, yeah, without getting too specific, it is just kind of weird things like that. Um, I'm sure I will think of some more later. So what about, um, what about in the last year crisis communications? Um, how are you approaching whether it's the pandemic or whether it's, other problems that business is having with, you know, bad press or whatever. Um, do you have any examples of how you would go about approaching that? Well, it's important to be proactive, right? To not um, not wait for your organization to be called upon to give a response, but to rather have something prepared ahead of time, um, because. In crisis communications, things happen so quickly that if you then spend hours or even, I mean, even days wait, working on a response that is a, the perfect messaging to different scenarios, um, you've lost that time and like whatever thread has exploded with other people commenting and seeing it and it's had time to make traction. Um, so that's one thing that we did a lot of. I remember when the pandemic started, like the next it was funny. It was like there was that weekend where I remember being out downtown and um, going to Collins Quarter and all this other stuff. And then on Monday, it was like everything changed. Everything was shutting down and we had to think like, OK, 
how are each of our clients going to be impacted by this? Like, what is the potential ramification for each of these different industries? And we said two weeks. I and we know. thought it was two weeks. But, I mean, like, Cecilia had the foresight to, to know that, I mean, that was something, it could be, we realized, like, this could be two weeks, but this could be something that just keeps changing and keeps growing. Um, so we did immediately, we stopped, put down all our other projects and thought about like, how will each client have to deal with this individually? And like, what, um, what are we ready? What are we prepared to say on? And what are we prepared to present to them as their response? So um, that was, that was really really good experience in crisis PR and it's funny I actually have you have to stay current on those things I have a course later this afternoon since I'm taking a week off before my next job so I've just a course in PR master class um awesome. this afternoon that I'm gonna do just to oh Matt like the fresh. master like, class um it is a it's a it's called a master class but I'm not doing the master class program I do want to at some yeah. point yeah me too yeah, that's a goal. I, maybe I'll Christmas present myself that. <laughs> well, so p people used to think of PR as just writing press releases and interfacing with the media, but now it's it's shifted way more into marketing and digital. Um, yeah, right. talk on that for a second. You can't do any of those things on their own, really. I mean, without... I mean, essentially, at that point, your client's going to have to hire, like several different people to all do the same thing and then you've got too many cooks in the kitchen or not to all do the same thing but all do different parts of what really should be all the same thing because your messaging has to cohere across whether it's social media um any advertising you put on social media or on billboards it just any kind of digital or print advertising and any of course like articles and um press release materials that you would be sending to the media and it it's really difficult to make one coherent brand if you're not in every single part of the client's communications with the public. So even if it's really hard to collaborate with someone else who's doing social media if you're only doing the press releases or, um, well, or if you ignore one of those many branches you're falling behind in reaching the public in, in some way or another, so. Yeah, plus like you're hiring out, either you're hiring a staff member to write blog posts for you, or you're going to a third party, you know, PR company like Cecilia Russo Marketing, and you're paying them to, to write press releases or whatever for you. So it makes sense, well, why don't we just use that some of that same content for the blog and for the mm -hmm. newsletter and for social media because you're right then it's consistent across platforms plus you're getting more bang for your buck yeah i love to think right from the get-go how many different ways something in particular can be used like we've worked with you for example and it's like okay great we have this long video this can go in an ad a little chunk of it can go in a social media ad a little chunk some chunks of it can just be used to showcase um what the client does at another time on their social media um if it's just like a fun video of them interacting with a customer or something um and then with written content exactly like you've got your keywords in there you structured it a very specific way it would it would it just really behooves you to keep using that content um for other purposes and even down the road like it'll change and evolve and you can pull bits and pieces of it. For sure. Mm -hmm. um, I want to apologize to the listeners for uh, my very loud puppy today. She's being so loud. She's drinking loudly and chewing on a bone. But I'm not going to tell her to stop. Because I love her. <laughs> but She's you're going to have to deal with that. Um, so tell me about... Uh, in college, I, I studied in New York City for a semester. And it's not a regret, but like it's one thing I wish I did was go abroad. Tell me about why you went abroad, why Scotland, and just your experience. Okay, yeah, that's that's a fun story. Um, I grew up really loving Harry Potter, 
I like started reading them with my mom when I was five. I was obsessed with the books and movies. This all is not throughout. where I thought this was going to go. No, but... it is. Okay. It is. That is really like the deep rooted thing. So when I got to, um, I remember going when I got to UGA. They had a study abroad fair at orientation, and I walked around and looked at all the programs. And they had two that stuck out to me. One was I was man- mi- minoring in Spanish, so I actually did this one first. I saw a May in Madrid program, so cool. I I did that one after my freshman year of college, and then I um, saw an Oxford, like UGA at Oxford, where you spend an entire semester over there um, taking actual Oxford classes with Oxford professors and students, and um, but you lived in. UGA is such an established program that they have a house where all the UGA students stay together in the city. Um, So I did that. And at the time, I I was dating my fiance, and he went to school in Edinburgh. And I visited it um, and fell in love with the city. Like, I loved Oxford, but Edinburgh was, it was so enchanting to me and so old and all the stone buildings between like new town and old town um i was completely enchanted and does that tie back to harry potter it does well it just does because um that's why i wanted to go to oxford i think i just Uh felt so much apart like i just wanted to go (laughs) to the uk um did you travel a lot as a kid yeah no i did i actually as a kid no i i traveled pretty much to see my family in texas Mm. and back and that was really, that was really all we did. I mean, we had, having Tybee here yeah. was so easy. And so so as you got older, it was kind of like, well, now I want to go out and see the world a I bit. did, and I wanted to see all those places where those movies were filmed. And, like, and J.K. Rowling's from, uh, she lives in Edinburgh. Oh, um, okay. But <laughs> did not spot her, but I hoped. But you um, Yes. Did, did you travel around a lot while you were over there? I did do a fair bit of traveling. Um, I went to Prague. I mean, not as much as you'd think because I, I was busy. It was class. a demanding yeah. course, yeah. But um, I did go to Prague. I loved Prague, absolutely. Like we, um, so I went with Sam, my fiance, and we spent four days there, and that was enough time to actually revisit some of our favorite spots. So, so that was that was a really lovely thing. Um, and I also. Spent, um, I did a couple trips to London. I did um, a road trip tour of Ireland, which included Dublin and Cork, um, to see Blarney Castle. Um, and then I'm trying to think. There were a lot of other little, like, small trips up and down in the Highlands and all that kind of thing um, through Scotland. So I really enjoyed that. But I love when I do when I do travel, I love being able to be a part of like the everyday mm. when you finally get to feel like, oh, this is a, I know my way around this place. I know how to feel not like a tourist, but to actually live and be in the city is what I've found to be really cool. And so, yeah, I don't think I could have done one of those like, oh, you're stopping in a different city every day for a month. Oh, no, it's better to I, do less places and just experience more. Yeah, that would have been overwhelming to me. But I, I did love, love learning the cities, like both Oxford and Edinburgh. So when people visit me in Savannah, I tell them, yes, you have to go to River Street. Yes, mm-hmm. you have to go to City Market. You have to see the fountain. But then I'm like, now let's go to the Starland District and hang out yeah. where I like to hang out mm-hmm. as somebody that, you know, lives here. So now Edinburgh's higher on my list. My first time going there, what are some things I have to do? Well, I mean, you've got to see um, the castle. That's, of course, like, you've got to see the castle. And if you're there in the summer, it'll be all decked out with festival things. Um, So if you want to go for the music and art and books and all of that great culture festival things, it's a completely different city in the summer. But it's got a lot of cool stuff going on because of that festival. it, and and so there will be stuff set up at the castle for that too, but um, I would say you also have to do Arthur's Seat. It is a mountain mm. that is kind of just right off the border of the city, and um, there's running trails and hiking trails, and um, there's also just you can climb straight up to the top if you're 
willing to do like a more intensive rocky hike um and a lot of people do that that's a that's another like number one tourist thing um but uh, the the campus is kind of spread out throughout the city so as you're just walking around it's really cool to see like the different parts of old campus um scattered throughout um I would do honestly I would do an underground tour too because there's Mm. so much still preserved of where people used to live and as the city has been built up and up um so like caves or tunnels they're so they're like old alleys but they are kind of like caves like they would at one time have been streets where people like lived and walked and now the city's just been built up over them wow yeah it's it's, it's really exciting i mean and there are some ghost ones around that too but is it (laughs) um is it like similar in size to savannah it's a I think it, I believe it is similar in size. It's a little bigger because it is their capital city. Mm. Um, but it's not, it's also more walkable. Like it is a bigger city in terms of people, but it's a little more condensed okay. because everyone mostly walks. And, and there are suburbs, like I think, like Sam lived out in the suburbs, but that means that I walked for 30 minutes to get mm. to where he lived rather than. <laughs> you know 10 minutes everywhere else do they have public like decent public transportation they do yeah. they do they yeah. do they that's one thing i system. noticed over there like yeah. well and in new york city but like here we've got the dot we've got but we don't have like a trolley or anything like that right not one that you can just hop on i know i love i love walking and there it never got so hot that you wanted to die <laughs> right. within five seconds of trying to walk somewhere <laughs> I say that now, and it's it's the middle of summer, pretty much. So yeah, we're, getting, yeah, we're, we're in it. The, yeah, <laughs> totally. So, what about Norfolk? Um, how how are you going to get involved? What are you looking forward to? All right. Well, I've already been my junior league's already transferred me on over there, so I am looking forward to getting involved in that, and hopefully, in like a little bit more of an involved way than I have been with the ju- I just went through the provisional year of junior league Savannah, like during COVID. So it was a little weird, and I definitely didn't get to dive in as much as I would have wanted to, um, and that's definitely everyone's experience over the course of that. But um, there's that, and then the Savannah JCs has been <laughs> just an absolutely incredible organization um, to be a part of, it, and indeed it was it stayed very active over the course of um, the last couple of years, and I really enjoyed all the people that I met and all the young professionals, and just um, there are so many people so excited to be building up Savannah and building themselves and their careers and connecting and doing great things. So I'm hoping to find something like that in um, a Norfolk chapter. <laughs> um, so I'll be excited about getting involved in that. And then, of course, like I love to teach Sunday school. So I'm going to try church. to find a church. And yep. then once I get plugged in there, I will start volunteering with the kids. What do you like about it? Do you like teaching or do you, I mean, is part of it being reading and teaching them how to read? Well, a lot of it is that. Um, yes, I really, I've always worked with kids because literacy is super important to me. And I love children. Um, I love working with them. Someday I'll hopefully have some. <laughs> But, um, yeah, so I, the, the teaching to read is really important. And in, in the context of the, of the church scenario, that's important. There's, there's kind of nothing like seeing a kid get it and light up and be like, oh, like, 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 why is this? Like, where's our strength in this? And they're like, Jesus. And they're excited about it. You're like, oh my gosh, this is an entirely different experience even than, than that light bulb moment when it's when it's a book but I, I of course love both I love I do love teaching and there that was one of those things where there were too many things I wanted to do so I'm like outside of work I will do all the teaching I can yeah through a little whatever bit of an outlet that way mm-hmm. um I love it there's a couple things that we could go a couple ways but I want to step back to the JC's really quick okay um so this is that's kind of where you and I get to know each other because I knew you through Cecilia Rosa Marketing but then when you joined the JC's that's when uh we got to know each other a little bit better. And for the listeners, uh, Zarek Samples was on the show two weeks ago. 
He's a J- Savannah JC, um, the co-founder of the Creative Truth is Taraz Misher. He, I also met him through the Savannah JCs. Um, so it is an awesome international service organization, short for Junior Chamber, so JC, um, and they have branches all over the the world. And our particular, they're non-partisan, non-affiliated with anything. You age twenty-one to forty, no do. Well, there uh, there is a membership fee. But that basically covers, like, we get meals at all mm-hmm. of our meetings. One of our members is a chef, Chef Steven. He'll probably come on the show at some point, um, which I'm going to make a note of. Um, so, yeah, if you are if you are a young professional in your city or you're moving to a new city, getting involved with uh, JC's is definitely, like, some good advice. Okay, so that's a little JC's plug. You're welcome, Leandria. Okay. <laughs> Next. Um, you you mentioned you're an avid reader. Um, do you still go back and reread the Harry Potter books? I do. Okay, I do. Don't. This is. Um, you know what? I'm proud of it. I actually wrote my dissertation on the Harry Potter oh, books. Yeah, I forgot yeah. that. That was one of your like. Uh, one of these things is true. and One is false. Right? Yes. Yes. That's often in my two truths and a lie. So, um, yeah. What was the dissertation about? So it was about how um, prophecy in the Harry Potter books, which is, I mean, because J.K. Rowling is brilliant and had her entire storyline and all the connections mapped out before she began page one, right? Which is just incredible to me. But she, so her prophecy plays a big role in those books. Mm. Um, And it was basically how it's informed by the free will versus predestination debate in Christianity. Because it does ultimately become... A Christian story that's evident by the end. Even though people think there's witches, so it's like a right. Satanist. I definitely had to introduce it that way. Like this is fiction; it's just a different way to understand something in our world. That well, it's like Narn- yeah. Chron- uh, Chronicles of Narnia. It's like the Chronicles of Narnia, similar. right? Like it's it's not that it's endorsing witchcraft it's just a it's just a a platform from which to approach an issue with our imaginations that we actually have to grapple with in real life Mm. and take something away from there um part of yeah i mean so a lot of series books tv whatever they go wrong because they start writing the beginning without knowing the end right Mm -hmm. um does how does that kind of affect the way you tell your stories in your career? Um, whether it's a specific example or just generally? Well, um, I guess whenever I'm writing something, it's important to me to have all of the... So, I I mean, I'm not writing a lot of fiction in my career. But um, what is... Any interest The, in the one thing... <laughs> I'm I'm the just on a little tangent. I'm the kind of person that is more likely to write something and then look back at it five days later and be like, "What? Like that's ridiculous." I'm so silly. So I'm in theory yes, but I don't think I have the confidence in my ideas yet to do that. Okay. I'm working on that. Um, but back to the my career. Um, when I am writing things for clients and their stories, it's really important to get the whole picture by talking to them and hearing what they have to say. Like, what are they as an individual and a leader of a company passionate about? And how do we build on on their story and their history? Um, because if you start writing a surface level article or press release that doesn't exhibit an understanding of who they are and, and what they want, like really ultimately want to accomplish it's flat Mm. and it doesn't it doesn't tell a story at all it just kind of will ramble um but knowing them and their character and where they want to be like what is the end goal like that's a way to see the end without without having an end where it's still um in the future it's just understanding the goal and helping your writing and your branding for them build towards that end goal so when you're talking to a local business, how do you determine what that story is and craft that? 
Right. Well, so it's got to have to do with what they do, but typically the owner um, or, you know, whoever's leading it, maybe even all the employees, depending on how close they are. Um, I think it's important to have employees have an idea of like, what's our mission? What are we doing? Like, what is our ultimate goal here as a company? Um, but then the owner, for example, will have something that they're passionate about that they that they care about deeply, um, whether it's the way that they serve customers or a specific thing in the community that they can do to support, you know, for example, young people learning a trade or a specific nonprofit. Um, and part of the job isn't just to tell the story, but to make that connection happen um, so that you're connecting people with whom, like for whom it makes sense to support a specific organization with that organization. Um, And then you're helping both of them get some name recognition and the nonprofit obviously gets a plug too, which is fun. Um, And a lot of times, like, it's really fun as a public relations professional to work with the nonprofit and learn more about the nonprofit too. and be able to write about that because there are so many stories you can tell when you involve the community. Um, And it it has a lot to do with just getting to know the client and their character and what they care about because that's a part of the company's story, especially on a local business level. That humanizes and, and gives people something to get behind more than just the service they provide. Perfect. So, <coughs> pardon me, you're moving, you're getting mm-hmm. married, you've got a, a, a bunch of things uh, to do in the, at the, at, through the rest of 2021. In 2022, how do you see yourself growing and changing in your career? Well, I, I expect to have kind of a big... A big step and exciting challenge ahead of me um, because I'm going to be working on implementing some things that aren't already there based on my experience um, and working with a great team, um, a team that, quite frankly, I picked out because it reminds me of the ladies at (laughs) Cecilia Reason Marketing um, and seems very supportive and all that. So I'm excited to work with them. Um, And I believe it will be, um, I hope to assume a lot more responsibility over different projects and because I'm still young in my career and, um, I still am a sponge. I try to be a sponge all the time, um, for anything that I can learn really from anybody. (laughs) So, um, that's, um, something I hope to have a lot more opportunity to do and, um, to really embrace that leadership of like, this is the experience I have and I know like how to move forward with it. And I actually kind of know what I'm doing a little bit in this next stage. So, um, so that's, that's actually been kind of like a weirdly empowering thing about this job search and like having to do the job search and having to move to Norfolk is like, I get to build out my resume again and like, think about all the stuff that I've done and talk about it with people and it was very encouraging to get get bites and like oh when I'm telling these stories I realize I do have this this and this experience and I know how I would apply that in another situation so I thought I know that's a kind of a different direction but um that's been a weird weirdly refreshing part of it (laughs) what advice would you give yourself if you were if you ran into yourself, a 17-year-old version of yourself. A 17-year-old version. Um, probably go ahead and let go of planning a little bit. <laughs> I mean, I definitely had – I've never been too tied to an overall plan. Um, and I think that's been good for me because I do tend to – I am a perfectionist. And I do tend – to latch on to things and it's important to not get upset when things don't go exactly how you may have thought that they were gonna go because every experience offers just a wealth 
of new knowledge. Mm -hmm. Um, if you go and seek that out, I probably would have told myself to be more confident in what I know that I know how to do and what I think I can figure out because I am not the most assertive of people. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, I think that comes with time too. Yeah. It, I'm sure it does. Um, I don't usually step into something like, you know, guns blazing. So, <laughs> but, um, but being eager to learn has served me well. And I, but I think I could have done with a fair share more confidence. Are you open to people connecting with you or do you want to plug uh, the peanut butter pantry? <laughs> following that um yeah so actually instead of having um it would probably behoove me to have a literary blog but I actually have a food <laughs> a easy recipe blog um called peanut butter pantry and because I love peanut butter it's one of my favorite things it's like my favorite snack are I think, all the recipes yeah. peanut butter related <laughs> no they really should be um I think I will take it more in that direction in the future because I keep kind of rebranding it so to speak but um the last the last one definitely was um <laughs> and um so it may go more that direction but I really like to cook and it's fun to write about it a little bit too it also just helps me keep track of recipes but um I'm not as prolific about writing on it as I should be mostly because I usually end up having to make something multiple times before I feel good about putting it on the blog and and getting a good photo of it which I got a new phone oh, so well you know where I'm at yeah. I need tips <laughs> on food the, the food photography has been a challenge for me that's for sure um because I'm like just go next Ooh. to a big window that's yeah. yeah right my apartment kind of is lacking in that but um I'll move and I'll have lots of big windows. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, so how can people find that? It is actually just on um, Skylar Lanier. That's S-K-Y-L-A-R-L-A-N-I-E-R uh, dot WordPress dot com. And I'll link that below. Okay. <laughs> Thank cool. you. Cool. Yeah. Um, very fascinating. You're a cook, a teacher, a reader, a world traveler. Um, I appreciate you coming on. I'm glad I caught you before the big move. Um, and I wish you guys the best luck in Norfolk. Thank you so much. Yeah, when I'm driving through, I'll uh, I'll shoot you a text. I'll be like, hey, I'm coming through. Oh yeah, you're yeah. welcome to have a couch anytime. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Um. So thank you for listening to another episode of the Creative Truth. Um. In upcoming episodes, I'm going to be talking to more artists, entrepreneurs, and creative professionals. If you have uh, episode feedback or guest suggestions, you can email me at wecreatetruth at gmail.com. If you're listening to this on iTunes, give me a good rating, please. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, ring the bell, whatever people say. And you can learn more and get some apparel at creative-truth.com. Skylar, thank you so much. Thank you. And we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for listening. Thank <laughs> you.